husband's his best wishes. Um, we're about 15 minutes behind, but what I would still like to do, given the way the conversation has gone, I was hoping to establish some sort of grounding uh, in this session. What I'd like to do is to have Michael Shermer just do a, a, a quick um, talk on um, sort of categories. I think this will help put us in, get, get things sorted out after these three, first three talks into where the debate is on this particular part of the issue. And then we'll take a break, um, and the panelists will still be here. We'll, the four of them will be here, and we'll start adding others. We'll, uh, Neil, Neil Tyson has arrived, and Neil Tyson will come up and talk after the break as well, and other people who will be surprised. Uh, uh, so I think uh, Michael Shermer, if you're ready. Michael is the founding director and publisher, of, uh, founding editor and publisher of Skeptic Magazine. Uh, uh, he's also a former college professor. He wrote a nice biography of Alfred Russell Wallace. And his latest book is Why Darwin Matters, The Case Against Intelligent Design. Michael Shermer. Thank you, Roger. Good to be here, everybody. If I'm moving a little slow, I threw my back out this week. And just as I was getting better, I brought three cases of Skeptic Magazine to give everybody. And, and that threw it out again this morning. So, But no worries, because you know we study chiropractic, and I've learned how to do it myself. So uh, I'll just show you a little thing here. Much better. <laughs> you see, there is a God, Michael. <laughs> My headache's gone. <laughs> well, I was trying to think of a little anecdote that would be appropriate. Huh? No, 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 please. I don't want to see um, Hang on. Let me see if they have any, <laughs> they have any uh, cups here. Uh, you're not supposed to Dust. show the reveal, but a little plastic cup goes a long ways for doing some simple magic tricks. <laughs> don't, don't tell Randy I did that, because uh, I'm only an amateur. <laughs> I really did throw my back out, though, so it's not, that's not funny. Uh, well, I was trying to think of an anecdote uh, appropriate for today, and I was on a book tour for my new book, Why Darwin Matters, on the East Coast last week, and a funny thing happened to me. I was... Um, uh, I was uh, had a couple hours before my evening talk, and I went for a, a little walkabout. This was in Philadelphia. I thought I'd go to see that Muter Museum that has all the the old uh, weird medical oddities from the 19th century. And uh, and uh, so I, I, I exited the hotel, one of these multi-story hotels, and I started down the sidewalk. And I was wearing this suit. And uh, it turns out, uh, back in January, we were in Las Vegas for the big Randy conference, the the amazing meeting and. And uh, one night we went to see the Penn and Teller show, the magician's Penn and Teller, and they end the show with this terrific uh, double bullet catch where Penn's on one side, Teller's on the other side. They each shoot these 357 Magnums, uh, which the bullets go through plate glass, uh, to pieces of, of glass there. The bullets themselves have been signed by two volunteers, the casing and the bullet, and then you can see... When the volunteers look at the, the two bullets that have crossed the stage, the one bullet is now in his mouth, the other bullet's in his mouth. And uh, I got to be one of the volunteers for this. And uh, it was pretty cool. My bullet that I put little MS on there uh, it actually ended up on the other side of the stage. I don't know how they did it. Uh, all I know is that they didn't actually shoot it and catch it. Uh, we know that much, but it's a good trick. Anyway, I got to keep the bullet. And I had put the bullet in this pocket. So, uh, so now months later, I, I exit the... The, the room, and, and I'm walking out of the hotel, and I hear this noise, and I look up, and there's a crazed evangelist who has heaved a Gideon's Bible out of the room, and it's hurtling toward me, and I duck, and the Bible struck me right in the chest, and that Bible would have gone right through my heart if it weren't for that bullet. <laughs> So, <laughs> not sure of the relevance of that. I like it. Oh, that's Mostly made-up story. <laughs> <laughs> Miracles do do occur. Well, um, uh, I, I've written many times about this kind of um, uh, three-tiered model that I put together when I originally wrote uh, "Why People Believe Weird Things," and I've just sort of applied it in, in various uh, books. That is. Uh, what is the relationship of science and religion? I, just roughly speaking, there's the sort of conflicting worlds model, um, same worlds, so, so they're in conflict, same worlds model, and then the separate worlds model. So largely what we've heard so far and will hear will fall into one of these three categories. 
Uh, obviously, there you know there's subtle differences, but just as a working model, it helps us to, to get our minds around this. So in the same world's model, it's the idea is that science and religion are just two different ways of looking at the same reality, and therefore we should have sort of mutual respect for them. Somebody uh, like uh, contemporary times here, Owen Gindrich's book, um, God's Universe, and perhaps um, um, uh, Francis Collins' book, would be, would be in this category. They're completely friendly to science. They accept all the findings of science, and, uh, and they feel that the science just uh, illuminates what they already believe. In, in my opinion, in, in virtually every case, um, these are instances of people that already believe for other reasons, and then they use the findings of science to uh, support what they already believe. Uh, and that's almost always the case, uh, because the reason people believe anything usually has to do more with psychology and sociology and how you were raised and, and the emotional impact and importance of the belief, and then you back into it with rational arguments after the fact. That's, that's what most of us do most of the time, politically, economically, ideologically, in, in every which way, including religion. So that's the same world's model. The conflicting world's model, which is held by virtually all of my atheist friends and fundamentalist Christian friends, is that one of them is right and the other one's wrong, depending on the particular thing you're talking about, and therefore you, you really need to pick one. One of them's right and the other one's wrong. And then finally, the third separate world's model, this would be best uh, supported, I suppose, by, by Steve Gould's uh, Noma idea, non-overlapping magisteria, that they're, they're really two different things, like pl plumbing and baseball or something. They just have nothing to do with one another. And so, therefore, they can't be in conflict. Um, so um, I guess, you know, we can just sort of think about that heuristic as we hear different uh, uh, views. I think the answer it depends in large part on, on what your goal is. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, lately because uh, since I'm in the business and I read all these books, I find myself in agreement with almost everybody. And how can that be? You have to be one of these tiers, don't you? And, and I think it depends on what your, your goal or purpose is. Um, if you feel like, say, Sam does, that religion is really a dangerous uh, social force that could bring down the demise of Western civilization, something like that, um, then the idea that, well, we should make nice uh, because we want to teach uh, good science and we want everybody to embrace science and so we should be polite to religious people, um, well, that's sort of irrelevant. If you think your larger goal here is I'm going to save Western civilization because look what the, the people that, like terrorists can do to us. So you would then pick which of these categories or which attitude you want to take toward religion depending on what your purpose is, what, what's your goal, what, what, what are you trying to accomplish. Um, so when I read, uh, like, Dawkins' book, I, I can't find much that I disagree with it at all, and yet I would never take that approach. And, 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 and why is that? And um, Because I, have, I think I have a different goal. It depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to talk religious people out of their beliefs, that would be one form of strategy. You would take a certain strategy to do that. The, uh, if your goal is something else, then maybe that wouldn't work. Um, I'm not saying this very well, but so let me back into it in, in a slightly different way. Um, uh, if your goal is to lead a rational, logical life, that is, you want to use science and reason and rationality and, and logic and so on to derive your ideas, to try to understand how the world works, and you want to apply this across the board to everything you do, uh, including the derivation of your ideas, but, but more than that, how you act in the world. Um, if you have derived certain ideas based on science and reason, and, and then you apply behavioral methods that do just the opposite of what your goals are, which I, I contend most contentious attitudes toward religion will do just the opposite of what most people claim they want to do. That it's not just that, well, you're not making nice, or, you know, you should really sacrifice your principles in, in, in this particular instance because we have some other goal. That, that isn't the reason, or we want to promote science education. That isn't the reason. It's that you're actually being irrational if you're doing something that does not accomplish your goal, that actually interferes with your goal. So you have to apply rationality, reason, logic, science, whatever, to all aspects of your life. And if you're going to do that, then you have to set your goals and determine, well, is it social context... Um, Social intelligence, social skills, emotional intelligence, how you interact with other people matters every bit as much as 
how you derive the age of the earth or whatever particular doctrines you believe. Um, I saw this example. I've been a, I'm not a member of any organized political party. I'm a libertarian, uh, which is like herding cats in, a, in an election next to impossible. And, uh, and I've been that way my whole life. And, and, and libertarians have the same problem, which is where I learned this, this principle, was um, that they're so fanatically um, focused on particular doctrines that you have to believe if you want to be considered a libertarian that they exclude almost all other libertarians. So exactly. almost nobody's a member of the group, which, yeah, you know, talk about morning. small tents. And so uh, people like Ayn Randians, uh, objectivists who are also atheists, would go around like uh, assaulting people that wore, wore crosses because they believe in God. And it's like, okay, but wait a minute. I thought your, your purpose was here. We want to have uh, a, a liberal democracy and a free market, and we want to promote these ideas of economic freedom. When you assault somebody's religiosity, how is that accomplishing this other goal? In fact, it's, it's going to do just the opposite. So in that sense, they're being irrational, and I claim so are, are depending on what your goal is. If your goal is just, if, let's, let's just be blunt. Let's say I'm pissed off about religion, and I want to get in people's face and tell them that I think you're being irrational, and you're an idiot, you're a moron to believe this stuff. Okay, if that's your goal, then by all means go for it. But what, what will that actually accomplish? And what are your goals anyway? So that, I think, helps us kind of set the stage for what it is we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think uh, uh, Darwin said this well. I take, I take two sources for this. Um, the first, the, the great um, libertarian writer uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises wrote in the 1950s against his fellow anti-communists, that being an anti-communist is completely... Uh, against what it is we're trying to do. It just virtually advertises the position we're against. You can't be against something. You have to be for something. And until you're for something, we're not going to accomplish any goals. And Darwin said something uh, along the same line. Since his name will be invoked throughout this weekend, um, I thought I'd um, read just a short, short section from my book about his own beliefs. He was a he was a creationist when he was in the Galapagos. He was a creationist when he left the Galapagos. He was a creationist until he got home and started thinking about this. Uh, it's too hot and miserable in the Galapagos to do any theorizing, <laughs> as I discovered. So, uh, and, and we also know he, didn't, he wasn't an evolutionist in the Galapagos because he didn't even record the islands from which he got the different specimens. In fact, they, uh, they stored uh, hundreds of, of uh, tortoises in the bowels of the beagle and, and ate the data on the way home and threw the carapaces over the overboard. If you're an evolutionist, you, you need to record, because of the principle of adaptive radiation, you need to record where all these different specimens came from. So, but later, uh, because of um, the uh, sort of uh, evil nature of the predator-prey relationships, the death of his daughter and other things, he lost his religiosity and never wrote about it publicly ever. We know what his beliefs were, however, from private letters. In 1879, just three years before he died, Darwin finally expressed his beliefs. In my most extreme fluctuations, I've never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. I think that generally, and more and more as I grow older, but not always, that an agnostic would be the more correct description of my state of mind. Here he's using Huxley's meaning that it, it's, um, it's not that we're waiting for more data. It could go this way, it could go that way. It's that there, there'll never be any data. There'll never be some experiment. Science can't adjudicate the problem. We're just simply without, it's beyond the realm of science. That's what Huxley meant, and that's what Darwin means here. A year later, Darwin clarified his thinking. The British socialist Edward Aveline had compiled a volume entitled the Students' Darwin on the Implications of Evolutionary Theory for Religious Thought. And Aveline wanted Darwin's endorsement. But, you know, like a little blurb on the back, you know, that you get from like that. <laughs> uh, the book had a militant anti-religious flavor and unabashedly radical atheist tone that Darwin disdained. And he declined the request, elaborating his reason with his usual flair for quotable maxims. Quote, it appears to me, whether rightly or wrongly, that direct arguments against Christianity and theism produce hardly any effect on the public, and freedom of thought is best promoted by the gradual illumination of men's minds, which follows from the advance of science. It has, therefore, always been my object to avoid writing on religion, and I have confined myself to science. He then appended an additional hint about a personal motive, noting, quote, I may, however, have been unduly biased by the pain which would it have given some members of my family if I aided in any direct attacks on religion. 
Darwin's wife, Emma, was a deeply religious woman, and out of respect for her, he kept the public side of his religious skepticism in check, an admirable feat of self-discipline by a man of high moral 